Welcome back. Remember last time we were talking about Akhenaten, the pharaoh who changed everything in Egypt and almost caused its destruction. Well, I mentioned that there was an unusual scene in the royal tomb. And if you remember, the royal family, Akhenaten and Nefertiti, were shown on the wall mourning, as if crying, over a bed on which lay a deceased female. A nurse was holding a child. And that nurse had a fan, a sunshade, which indicated that that child was royal. Well, the tomb is badly damaged, and we don't have the captions that would tell us who is that female on the bed, or who is that child. But let me tell you what the best guess is, the best theory about what's going on there. And you'll see that this leads to our next pharaoh, probably the most famous pharaoh in all of Egypt, Tutankhamun. The best guess is that the female lying on the bed is Akhenaten's other wife, Kia, the minor wife. And she has died in childbirth. And the child that the nurse is holding is the one she's just given birth to. And that child, the son of Akhenaten and Kia, is Tutankhamun, the most famous king in Egypt. We can't be sure, but let me say that we're going to discuss this in detail a little later. Tutankhamun is so important, so famous, that I'm going to devote two lectures to him. Now, the first one today, I want to talk about the discovery of his tomb. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to use Tutankhamun as an example of how do you discover a royal tomb. So if you want to go out and do it, you'll be able to do it after this lecture. Now, first, let me say this. Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered not by accident. It was discovered because the people who found it knew what they were looking for. They were intelligent. They had done research in libraries. This was no, oh my goodness, we've stumbled on a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Not at all. This was hard work. But let me say something about the history of the Valley of the Kings leading up to Tutankhamun's discovery. Eventually, Egypt collapsed for good. As you know, probably, the very end of the civilization, the Greeks conquered, and then Egypt sort of gets lost to antiquity. But the Valley of the Kings always remained, but unguarded. Naturally, most of the tombs are robbed. But even in antiquity, tourists, Greek tourists, came to Egypt to see the Valley of the Kings. Some of them wrote graffiti. I mean, I remember one on a tomb wall. It's so funny. It talks about this guy, a Greek. He says, I was here and wasn't impressed. Right? That's what he said. I was here and I was not impressed. Some people you just can't impress. But anyway, in the first century, the historian Diodorus visited the Valley of the Kings. And he spoke to the priests there who were still vestiges of the old Egypt. And they said there are 47 tombs. He couldn't see all of them. He could only see a few that were open. But they told him there were 47 tombs. Much later, 1739, a sea captain, Richard Pocock, one of the first to go to the Valley of the Kings from Europe, because it's all the way in the south, remember. He went there and he said there were nine tombs open. You could go into nine tombs. Now remember, they're caverns that are artificially excavated into the mountain with carvings on either side. So he said you could visit nine of them. So throughout antiquity, the Valley of the Kings was open. You could, you could see it. Bonaparte's savants, when they went with him to Egypt in 1798, they explored the Valley of the Kings, and they even discovered a new tomb, the tomb of Amenhotep III, the father of Akhenaten. They found that tomb and published it and were quite proud of it. They did the first accurate map of the Valley of the Kings. So 1798, we have tombs still being discovered. And then things change. Around the beginning of the 19th century, 1810, 1812, a new excavator comes to the Valley of the Kings. He's, a, he's one of the great characters of all time. His name is Giovanni Battista Belzoni. Belzoni was amazing. He started out life as a monk. Monastic life didn't suit him, so he became a strong man in a circus. He was six foot six, known as the Patagonian giant. He was really incredible. And he would perform in circuses as a strong man. Gave that up, became an engineer. 
and eventually he sought his fortune in Egypt. He came over to Egypt to sell a new device for raising water from the Nile for irrigation, a new kind of pump. He showed it to the rulers of Egypt, and it was a terrible accident. The machine broke and someone's leg was broken, and that was the end of Belzoni's career as an engineer. He's stuck in Egypt, this giant of a man, strong man. What is he going to do? He decides to excavate. He will make his fortune by bringing back antiquities from Egypt and selling them to Europe. So Belzoni begins the first systematic excavation in the Valley of the Kings. And how do you go about looking for a tomb that's been lost for 3,000 years? Belzoni had the right idea. Belzoni reasoned that whenever you have a tomb excavated, you're going to have lots of limestone chips. It's limestone, the, the, the stone. And as the workers go in and they're chiseling away, you're going to get chips, flake, flake, flake. They keep going in. And you're going to have tons and tons of limestone chips. And they're going to have to throw them out. So he would go through the Valley of the Kings looking for piles of limestone chips. And he figured, well, you find a pile, the tomb's not going to be far away. And he discovered some tombs. He discovered the tomb of Seti I, a pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. A beautiful tomb. And it was still with the sarcophagus. The treasures had been long gone. But the stone sarcophagus was still there. And he moved it from Egypt to England and sold it. And it's today, you can still see the sarcophagus of Seti I. It's in John Soane's Museum in London. It's in a private museum in London, the sarcophagus of Seti I, discovered by Belzoni. Interesting thing about a sarcophagus, by the way, you should know the difference between a sarcophagus and a coffin. A coffin's made of wood. A sarcophagus is made of stone. Now, think about the word sarcophagus. What English word does it sound like? As close as you can get is esophagus, right? And there's a reason for that. When the Greeks came into Egypt and they discovered sarcophagi, and they would take the lid off, and they'd look inside, and they'd see a mummy. Now, a mummy is, of course, dehydrated. And they would look at the mummy in the sarcophagus, and they would call the stone box that it was in a flesh eater, sarcophagus because the flesh was all gone from the mummy. So sarcophagus really means flesh eater, and it was named by the Greeks. So you'll always remember that a sarcophagus is stone, and Bolzoni discovers the sarcophagus of Seti I and moves it to England. Bolzoni discovers some other tombs, right? He's doing quite well. But up until this time, say 18, 18 even, no pharaoh's body had ever been found in the Valley of the Kings. Where were they? They had found quite a few tombs. The robbers shouldn't want bodies. They would want the jewels on it, maybe, the treasures in the tomb. But who cares about bones and mummies? No mummy had ever been found in the Valley of the Kings. Then, in 1881, the answer to where are all the king's mummies was revealed. It's an amazing story. In the late 1870s, royal antiquities started appearing on the antiquity market in Egypt. The antiquity dealers all of a sudden had objects of royalty. Books of the dead, these long papyri that were written to help the deceased resurrect in the next world, they found papyri of queens. Now, very soon, all the Egyptologists were aware that something had been found. E.A. Wallace Budge, the curator of the British Museum's Egyptian collection, went over to Egypt and bought some of these papyri for the British Museum. The, the, the papyrus of Queen, Queen so-and-so, the papyrus of King so-and-so. Where were they coming from? Then, gold amulets started appearing with royal names. So in the late 1870s, everybody knew something had been found. Very soon, the director of antiquities for Egypt, Gaston Maspero, went down to the Valley of the Kings area and started questioning people. He died before he ever found the answer. He was on the trail. He thought that a family of grave robbers, there was a family of grave robbers near the Valley of the Kings. In the village right next to the Valley of the Kings is Gurna, a valley 
a, a village that lives right next, and some of them live right above tombs of the Valley of the Kings. They had been tomb robbers for years, the Abdurazul family. And he started questioning the Abdurazul, but, but he died. Maspero died before he could figure it out. His successor went down, Mariette, and they questioned the Razul family. There were three brothers who were involved. And the brothers were tortured. I mean, this was the 1880s now, and they were not kind to Egyptians. And they were tortured, but they never revealed the secret under torture. Then, one of the brothers made a deal with the Antiquity Service. He said, I will show you where the tomb is. Mariette was out of the country, the director of Antiquities, the new director, when this was going to be revealed. His assistant was sent to Thebes, and the Razul brothers took them up a cliff near the Valley of the Kings, very close to the Valley of the Kings, walked high up near Hatshepsut's dear old Bahari temple, and there was a shaft going down about 30 feet, a large shaft, maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. And they lowered the assistant down into the shaft. His name was Brugish. Down into the shaft. And then there was a cavern going in, like a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. And when he saw what was on either side of the cavern, he didn't understand what he was looking at. He couldn't figure it out. It was packed with coffins. On either side, leading all the way to the back, and what he couldn't figure out, now this was an Egyptologist who could read hieroglyphs. He started reading the names on the coffins. This is where all the great kings of Egypt were buried. For example, Ramses the Great, a pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, he was there. Tutmosis III, the nephew of Hatshepsut, for whom she was regent, he was there. There were kings and queens of all kinds of dynasties, of the 21st dynasty, of the 20th dynasty. It was as if in the same tomb you found George Washington buried with Abraham Lincoln, buried with Coolidge. It didn't make any sense. How did kings and queens of different periods come to be buried in this one tomb? He just couldn't figure it out. I'll tell you the answer. We do know now, no. We, we, we know. At some point in Egyptian history, we know exactly when, the 21st dynasty. Egypt had declined somewhat. Pharaohs were still buried in the Valley of the Kings, but Egypt had declined so much that they didn't have the guards always present in the Valley of the Kings. And widespread looting occurred. During the 21st dynasty, there was an inventory of the tombs. Officials were sent to inspect the tombs of the kings of Egypt to make sure they were intact. They had all been robbed, all been robbed. They had been robbed in the 20th dynasty. And later, Egyptologists found papyri, which are court records, where the tomb robbers are caught, punished, executed. And we know, yes, we entered the tomb of the August Pharaoh. We did this, we did that. So what had happened in the 20th and 21st dynasty is that there was widespread looting in the Valley of the Kings. What to do? What to do? It was decided by the Pharaoh that all the kings would be gathered taken out of their tombs and put in one tomb, one single secret tomb for safekeeping. And this is the tomb that was discovered in 1881. This is called the Deir al-Bahari Cache because it's near Hatshepsut's temple at Deir al-Bahari. And this is how kings of different periods came to be buried together. These are the first bodies of pharaohs ever found. But Tutankhamun was not among them. Tutankhamun was still missing. And our story is about the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Later, 1898, another tomb in the Valley of the Kings was discovered. The tomb of Amenhotep II. It was a strange excavation. The excavator was a little bit unstable, mentally unstable. And he, and he literally went mad after opening the tomb. He went in at night. He had been excavating and excavating. And finally, they opened the tomb late at night. He goes in with candles. And he's going through, and he sees mummies all over. And he's not sure exactly what he's looking at. To make a long story short, in the end, this is the tomb of Amenhotep II, 
Amenhotep II is still in his sarcophagus in the tomb. Right? Good, you've got one mummy now in the tomb. Treasures are all gone. But there's a side chamber, which is bricked up with stones. They remove the stones, and there are some more kings of Egypt. More kings of Egypt. Amenhotep III, the father of Agnan, right? There are, there are pharaohs left and right. They had some more pharaohs that they put for safekeeping in this tomb. Tutankhamun was not there. He is still missing from history. Now, several excavators, several excavators had heard of Tutankhamun. He is not a well-known pharaoh. Not a well-known pharaoh at all. The first excavator to really think about Tutankhamun is an excavator named Flinders Petrie. Flinders Petrie. Great, great figure in Egyptology. He is the first modern Egyptologist. Scientific techniques. Petrie is the first one who wasn't a treasure hunter. He excavated in the 1880s, 1890s. He kept going. He died at the age of 94. He excavated for 70 years in Egypt. His biography is called 70 Years of Excavation. Right? Great man. He is the one who realizes that pottery is worth something. Everybody else used to throw out all the pots. They were looking for the gold and the amulets. He is the one who realizes, you know, if you look at pottery, you can figure out which civilization is earlier or later. For example, one civilization has a simple pot. The next excavation you do has the same simple pot, but it has decorations on it. So that probably comes later. And then maybe another civilization has the pot with the decorations with handles, a new innovation. So that's later. So he figures out sequential dating by pottery. Nobody cared about pottery before. They threw it out. So Petrie is really a careful excavator, not a treasure hunter. He went to excavate in the 1880s at Tel Al Amarna, Akhenaten's city in the desert. And he found all these fabulous statues that look strange. And, but he also found objects with the name on it of a pharaoh nobody had heard of, Tutank Aten. It's Tutank Amun, who's going to change his name later. And that is the son who was born to Kia and Akhenaten at Amarna. So Petrie finds these objects with the name in a cartouche, that oval that represents a pharaoh's name. The word cartouche has an interesting story also. It comes from Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798. If you look at a cartouche, the oval that encircles a pharaoh's name, and it has a line at the bottom, the oval represents a rope. It's a protective encircling of the pharaoh's name by magic. But if you look at that rope and the line at the bottom, it looks like a cartridge shell, like a bullet. And that's the French word, cartouche. When Napoleon's soldiers saw this on the temple walls, they said, oh, it's a cartouche. So he found the name of Tutankhaten in a cartouche, and he knew we have a missing pharaoh. Now, nobody had heard of this king. Not an important king. Nobody knew who he was. But he knew that it was somebody. Now. Enter the discoverer of Tutankhamun's tomb, Howard Carter. Howard Carter did not start out as an archaeologist. In those days, nobody did. Petrie, the great archaeologist, was a surveyor who went to survey the Great Pyramid and just stayed on in Egypt for 70 years. Carter was an artist, came from a family of artists. He had something like 11 brothers who were artists. His father had made a very good living drawing the pets of the wealthy in England. You know, he would go and he would do a great portrait of Fido or whatever, of the horse or whatever, and made a fairly good living. And Howard Carter was an artist. One of the great patrons of Carter's father was Lord Amherst, Lord Amherst of Hackney, who collected Egyptian antiquities. And Carter, as a boy, went to Didlington Hall, where the Amherst lived, saw the antiquities collections, was impressed by them, and continued with his art. And this is the connection by which Howard Carter gets to Egypt. Flinders Petrie, excavating in Amarna, who knows Lord and Lady Amherst, their patrons, writes to Lady Amherst and says, Lady Amherst, I need an artist for my excavation. Can you send me someone, young, who preferably is not a gentleman, because he will not make too many demands? Right, so he wanted somebody who's a little bit lower class, who won't make too many demands. And Lady Amherst said, yep, I got the right kid for you, Howard Carter. So Howard Carter is dispatched from England at the age of 17 to be an artist under Flinders Petrie at Amarna. 
We have the diaries of Flinders Petrie when Carter arrives. He says, well, I didn't know how good this kid was, so I put him to work in a dump, you know, in the garbage dump, working, going through there, seeing what they had thrown out at Tel Alamarna. And this is where Howard Carter got his first archaeological training as an artist and an excavator under Flinders Petrie. Later, another excavator, Percy Newberry, who was excavating at a place called Beni Hassan, Beni Hassan, hires Carter as the artist, and Carter sees more excavating. Nobody's trained as archaeologists then. And eventually, at the age of 26, Howard Carter becomes the inspector of antiquities for the Valley of the Kings. He gets the job of being inspector for the Valley of the Kings. Now, he is going to discover Tutankhamun's tomb, but not immediately, because he's not permitted to dig. He's an inspector. At this time, the person who is digging in the Valley of the Kings is an American, a wealthy American, not an archaeologist, from Rhode Island, right? Theodore Davis. Anybody who had money could excavate in the Valley of the Kings. You came, you said, I want to excavate. They wrote up a concession. Now, a concession is the permission to excavate. And it tells you where you can excavate, and it discusses the division of the fines. Usually, you get to keep half. The deal was in the old days. You excavate, you keep half, Egypt keeps half. And Theodore Davis started excavating in the Valley of the Kings. Didn't know much, didn't know much, but in his excavations, under a rock, his excavator, Ayrton, found a faience cup. Now, faience is a ceramic, like porcelain. And on it was the name of Tutankhamun. So that is the first thing to connect Tutankhamun with the Valley of the Kings, a faience cup. Later, Davis found a pit, small pit, maybe five feet by five feet. But in it were bandages with Tutankhamun's name on it, a couple of cups, Tutankhamun's name on it, and the remains of some animal bones. Right? A very strange collection, dishes, animal bones, and floral collars, pectorals that were worn by people made of flowers, tied on. Howard Carter was the inspector. He was just watching. Davis thought that he had found the tomb of Tutankhamun, terribly robbed, destroyed. And he said, I fear the Valley of the Kings is now played out. He published a book called The Tomb of Tutankhamun, where he said, I found it. And now there's nothing left to discover in the Valley of the Kings. So Theodore Davis gave up his concession to the Valley of the Kings. He said, I no longer want to excavate in the Valley of the Kings. Everything is discovered. Now, Carter knew he hadn't found the valley, had, hadn't found Tutankhamun's tomb. What he had found was the remains of a last meal eaten by the relatives of Tutankhamun when they buried him. When you buried a pharaoh, you wore pectoral, little, little floral collars, you had a meal, and you buried the dishes and everything else because they were sacred. So Carter knew that Davis hadn't found it. But he was not in a position to dig yet. Right? He's inspector of antiquities. But soon he would lose his job. There was a terrible incident at Saqqara. He was transferred to Saqqara. Howard Carter was transferred to Saqqara as inspector. A kind of step up almost. And a group of French tourists were going into a tomb without tickets. You had to buy a ticket even then. And they didn't have tickets, they were drunk, and they pushed by the gafir, the guard, the, the Egyptian native guard for the tomb. Pushed by him, the guard defended himself, pushed them away, and this was an international incident. How dare an Egyptian touch the French? Carter stood by the guard. The guard was right, they shouldn't have come in, they were drunk. The French inspector of antiquities asked Carter to make an apology. Carter refused. He stood by the guard and was fired. Right? So he did the right thing. Now he was unemployed. Now enter the second discoverer of Tutankhamun's tomb, Lord Carnarvon, a wealthy Englishman. Carnarvon has a wonderful distinction. He is involved in the first automobile accident, period. He had the second car ever registered in England, and he wrapped it around a tree. As all wealthy Englishmen did then, he went to Egypt to recover, fell in love with the climate, and thought, wouldn't it be nice to excavate? But he needed an excavator. He wasn't going to take a shovel himself, Lord Carnarvon. So he's looking around for an excavator. 
And here we have unemployed Howard Carter, the artist, who is trying to support himself at this time in Egypt by doing portraits of the tombs, you know, paintings of the tombs, doing paintings, and selling them to tourists. That's how he's making a living. So he hires Carter, and Carter says to him, you know, I'd really like to excavate in the Valley of the Kings. I think Tutankhamun's missing. Davis gives up the concession, and as soon as he gives it up, Carter and Carnarvon say, we'd like to excavate in the Valley of the Kings. And they get the concession. So Carter and Carnarvon, around 1915 or so, are ready to excavate in the Valley of the Kings. The problem is World War I breaks out, and they can't excavate. It's going to have to wait. But they are looking for the Valley of the Kings missing tomb to Tutankhamun. Now, Carter draws the first very detailed map of the Valley of the Kings. Very detailed. Every space that has been excavated is marked, and every unexcavated space is marked. So he knows what's been excavated to bedrock. And he and Carnarvon agree they will excavate every inch of the Valley of the Kings down to bedrock till they find Tutankhamun's tomb. They start excavating finally, right, looking for Tutankhamun's tomb. They excavate for several years and don't find anything significant. In 1921, Carter goes to England to visit Lord Carnarvon at Highclere Castle. And Carnarvon says to him, you know, we haven't found anything in years. I think it's time to quit. Carter says, I know we're near. Give me one more chance. Give me one more chance. Carnarvon's a gentleman. Carter offered to pay for the last season's excavation. He couldn't afford it. Carnarvon says, you have one more year. In the last year, 1922, on November 4th of 1922, Carter realized there was one little triangle that hadn't been excavated. The reason it hadn't been excavated was that when, they, when the workers built the tomb of Ramses VI, they dumped all the chips on this one area, they dumped it in this area, and this has never been moved. He moves the chips. At the bottom, he founds, finds workmen's huts made of stone where workmen lived. He removes the, the workmen's huts, and they find a step going down into the ground. They had found the tomb of Tutankhamun. Carter knew it. He wires to Lord Carnarvon, have made wonderful discovery, come immediately, await your arrival. He clears the steps down to a door which is sealed with the seal of the necropolis on it, right on it. It's jackals, the seven jackals, right? They're, they're there. It's an undisturbed tomb, or at least seems to be undisturbed. Carter waits for Carnarvon. This is his patron. They, they should share in this. He makes a little hole in the wall when, when Carnarvon comes and peers in with a candle. And Carnarvon says to him, what can you see? And Carter answers, wonderful things, wonderful things. They were looking into the antechamber, the first chamber of the tomb, and it was chock-a-block with objects piled up to the ceiling. It wasn't a neat arrangement of a tomb. It was as if things had been almost thrown in helter-skelter because there was no room for it. They then remove the wall carefully. Now, this is not an easy excavation by any means. You'll see next time. Not easy at all. They remove the wall, and there are so many objects that it's going to take months just to remove them. But this is the first time that a pharaoh's tomb had ever been found intact. Now, it's quite interesting, the legal arrangement that Carter and Carnarvon had with the Egyptian government. The deal was 50-50 division of the fines for any tomb found that had been robbed or disturbed. But for any tomb found intact, everything stays in Egypt. Because that would be such an amazing finding that it should stay in Egypt. And that's why you can see Tutankhamun's treasures in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo today. Nothing was given away. It's all intact. So Carter and Carnarvon together have discovered the tomb of the most famous pharaoh of all time. And it's not because of good luck. It's because of hard, dogged, persistent work. The tomb showed many amazing things. For example, there were funerary couches, couches on which rituals had taken place in the shape of a hippopotamus, in the shape of a lion, the heads of lions, hippopotamuses. These were all gilded in gold. All they could see was gold when they looked through the hole. You know, they just said, Wonderful things, he meant gold. 
And it would take them years to excavate the tomb. It was so full. One of the things that was in the tomb that I feel is the most important that we're going to talk about next time is the mummy of Tutankhamun, intact, undisturbed. And next time, we're going to talk about what that mummy shows us. So I'll see you then.